let's get into the Word this morning. Open your Bibles to John chapter 7, if you would. Title of the message this morning is Blinded by Expectations. Blinded by Expectations. Who here has ever been blinded by expectations? Can I see a show of hands? Right? I know for me, on Tuesday, I had a different expectation. Right? I thought how things would go, even though the polls told me otherwise. I had blind expectations, frankly, of a different outcome. And Tuesday night, I couldn't sleep. Wednesday night, I couldn't sleep. Thursday, it, it's just dawned on me, Kanye's not going to be our president. Yeah. <laughs> As we continue our study this morning through the Gospel of John, Jesus isn't running for election here, but he's not who the people were expecting either. And we're going to take a look with, at that, and we're going to see how that impacts us today. Let's pick it up in verse 25 where we left off. Jesus has gone up to Jerusalem for the Feast of Tabernacles. And it says there, Now some of them from Jerusalem said, Is this not he whom they seek to kill? But look, he speaks boldly, and they say nothing to him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is truly the Christ? You'll recall Jesus had gone up uh, to Jerusalem for the Feast of Tabernacles, didn't go up with uh, his brothers and the caravan going up. He delayed, but being up there, then he went into uh, the, the, uh, the, the temple to preach, right? And, uh, and so they're like, do they know that this is truly the Christ? However, we know where this man is from. But when the Christ comes, no one knows where he's from. If you were to to sketch a rough outline of John chapter 7, basically the chapter breaks down into three sections. You've got disbelief, you've got debate, and then you have division. Disbelief, debate, and division. Sounds like the United States. Over the last couple of weeks, we've looked at the disbelief of Jesus' brothers, we've looked at the disbelief of the Jews, and we've looked at uh, a debate that is going on with the people, and the debate centers around whether or not Jesus' teaching is good or whether it's deceptive. And And today, the debate continues regarding who Jesus is, and we see three distinct groups involved in this debate. We have the Jewish leaders. These are the guys that live in Jerusalem. They run things in the, you know, run the show there in Jerusalem. Uh, they hate Jesus with a passion and they want him dead. Uh, you've got the crowds who live outside of Jerusalem who have migrated there for the Feast of Tabernacles. And uh, they're in the dark about the leaders' intentions. We saw that last week back in verse 20. Jesus says, uh, you know, basically, Uh, why do you guys want to kill me? And all of these guys who are in the dark are like, you're high, man. We're not not trying to kill you. Why? Because they're not aware of what the the Jewish leader's intention are. And then you've got the locals. And the locals are the people who live in Jerusalem. And, And these locals, they sit under the teaching of the religious leaders. They've got an idea that the religious leaders want to kill them. And so now they're confused here in verse 25. They're, they're, they see him, you know, teaching boldly, and, and they're like, well, why are the leaders allowing this? Why aren't they stopping this? And then they go, could it be that this is actually the Messiah? Is that why they're, they're, uh, they're uh, allowing this? Now, let me stop right there and emphasize that this question that they ask is the single most important question that everybody on the face of the earth needs to wrestle with. And that question is, who do you say that Jesus is? Could he be the Messiah? Who do you say that Jesus is? Jesus, speaking to his disciples in Matthew 16, he asked them this question. I'll put it on the screen for you. He said, uh, it tells us, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And so they, they said to him, some say John the Baptist, some say you're Elijah, others Jeremiah, one of the prophets. And then Jesus said to them, but who do you say, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and he said, you are the Christ, you are the son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, Simon son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. 
but my Father who is in heaven. Here now in verse 26, these locals are questioning if Jesus is really the Messiah. But you know, in the very next verse, they answer their own question. They kind of seem to rule that out because look at verse 27. They say, you know, they, verse 26, could this be the Messiah? And then verse 27 is like, nah. It says, however, we know where this man is from, but when the Christ comes, nobody knows where he is from. See, understand these people have a problem, and their problem is expectation. Their problem is that they have a very particular expectation. See, many of the Jews believed that when the Messiah would appear, that he would appear suddenly as if out of nowhere. Uh, they based this belief on a few Old Testament scriptures. One of the, the main ones was uh, in Malachi chapter 3. Again, I'll put it on the screen for you. Uh, Malachi writes this, Behold, this is God speaking through the prophet Malachi, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. Now, understand, the prophet Malachi, he was the last Old Testament prophet through whom God spoke to Israel. Well, that's technically not true. Actually, John the Baptist was the last Old Testament prophet, but in your Old Testament uh, section of your Bible, you'll see that Malachi is the very last book there. And Malachi's words were spoken to Israel, and then God was silent for 400 years before John the Baptist came on the scene. And the, the silence broken by John the Baptist, right? Uh, and that was when the first part of Malachi was fulfilled, that Jesus had, that, that um, John had gone before Jesus to proclaim the coming of the Messiah, and he was then followed by, by Jesus. However, the people, as it pertains to the, the prophecy given by Malachi, they, they misinterpreted the suddenly part of what Malachi had said. Right, Because uh, he says, I'm going to send my messenger. He's going to prepare the way before me. And the Lord, whom you seek, will suddenly come to his temple. So they thought that that was all going to happen at the same time. Right? They misinterpreted this suddenly part. Because they thought it meant that Messiah would appear uh, right after the messenger came. That he would appear suddenly out of thin air. And uh, he would just dramatically come on the scene and set up shop there. Uh, in, uh, in Israel, they completely missed or ignored, combination of both, all of the other Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah. The prophecies that spoke of the Messiah being born in Bethlehem. The prophecies that spoke of the Messiah being called a Nazarene. And the biggest thing that they ignored was what Isaiah the prophet wrote about him. Again, uh, put on the screen, Isaiah 53 Isaiah writes, Who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Now let's break that down. Isaiah prophesied there in verse 2 of Isaiah 50, uh, 55, that, uh, I'm sorry, Isaiah 53, that he, the Messiah, shall grow up before him, God the Father, as a tender plant. And Jesus did grow up. He took on human flesh. He was born in Bethlehem. He was raised in Nazareth, just as it had been prophesied. And Luke chapter 2, speaking of his childhood, tells us that Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and with men. As well, Jesus grew up as a tender plant. Plant. In other words, he was of seeming weakness and insignificance. Also, Isaiah prophesied that Jesus would grow up as a root from dry ground. And fulfilling that, Jesus grew up in the Galilee region of Roman-occupied Palestine, right? And so, a root from dry ground. And in respect to spiritual and political uh, and standard of living matters, certainly that was dry ground. But the biggest thing these guys missed or ignored was what Isaiah says in the very next verse. It says, 
that he was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we didn't care. You see, Jesus here in his first coming, the people are rejecting him. And even though God has told them all of these things beforehand, He doesn't meet their expectations. They've got it all worked out in their head. They think how all of this is going to go down, and because it doesn't happen the way they expect, they're rejecting Him. So understand, when Malachi prophesied, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, his messenger is a reference to John the Baptist, who prepared the way for Jesus' first coming, but his coming suddenly is a reference to Jesus' second coming. Right? Because in his first coming, he was rejected by the Jews. Let's, let's apply that. How do, we, how do we apply that to our lives? We come, we come to church and we hear a lesson. It's not just history, right? It, it applies to us. And so how do we apply this issue of expectation to our life today? Well, when it comes to believing and trusting in Jesus, expectation tends to be a problem for Christians. See, some expect Jesus to be their glorified butler and their cosmic genie, right? So the Jesus, air quotes, that they are looking for is not the Jesus of the Bible. We have a term for this. It's called moralistic therapeutic deism. And basically, you know, hey, you believe that there's a God. You believe that he saves sinners. uh, You believe that everybody's good and that, you know, hey, because I'm not Charles Manson, you know, I, I get a pass. And moralistic therapeutic deism also believes that basically God's on call. That he created everything and then he split and now it's like the Hunger Games. Good luck. May the odds ever be in your favor, you know, and you just sort of do your thing. And then when you get in trouble, you pull Jesus out of the trunk and put the the spare tire Jesus onto whatever you're going through. And, And then after you're all done, back in the trunk, you know. And you just keep being the the captain of your own ship, right? Others have a problem with expectation where they expect Jesus to reveal himself to them on their own terms. I I told you a few weeks ago about a friend of mine. uh, You know, walked for years professing faith in Jesus Christ, but then decided one day, hey, you know what? Jesus, if he's real, he should do something supernatural to prove to me that he's real. Uh, Raising from the dead wasn't enough for him. Uh, you know, and so basically he said, you know, he should be able, you know, if God's real, he should move that cup from here to there and prove to me that that he exists. And because he won't do that, I'm not going to believe in him. And sadly, my friend has walked away from the Lord. Expecting Jesus to operate on your own terms. Others have a problem with expectation because they expect that when they come to Jesus, it's going to, life is just going to be puppy dogs and butterflies that everything's going to be great, that it's like, you know, a country western song played backwards. You get your car back, you get your truck back, you get your dog back, you get your wife back, right? But then when persecution comes, they walk away. Jesus described this problem in the parable of the sower in Matthew 13. Jesus said, but he who received the seed on stony places, the seed stands for the word of God, This is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. And yet he has no root in himself, but he endures only for a while. For when, take note of that, we'll come back to that. When tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. See, he had a bad expectation. He expected, hey, when I come to Jesus, it's all going to be uphill from there. Or downhill, it's just going to be smooth sailing. Paul told Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3, everybody who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Will suffer persecution. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Here's the question of application today. When it comes to expectation, what Jesus are you expecting? Does the Jesus that you're expecting line up 
with the Jesus of the Bible? Or, or is it a genie of your own choosing? We've got to take a walk with that question because this is train wrecking the people of, of, uh, of Jerusalem and, and of Israel. Hey, we've got a certain expectation that God's got to fit in, and if He doesn't fit into our expectation, we are going to reject Him. Huge problem. Now, I told you that the single most important question that everybody on the face of the earth has to answer is, who do you say that Jesus is? And we looked at Jesus challenging his own disciples with the same question in Matthew's gospel. And I want you to notice again there in Matthew 16 how Jesus replies to Peter when he gives him the right answer. Simon Peter answers, says, you're the Christ, you're the son of the living God. And notice what Jesus says. He says, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, Simon son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. See, Jesus says, Peter, you got that question right because God the Father revealed that to you. Now, in stark contrast to that experience, notice now what Jesus says to the people here in John chapter 7 in verse 28. They're rejecting Jesus because he doesn't meet their expectation of him. Notice what he says. Jesus cried out as he taught in the temple, saying, you both know me and you know where I am from. And I've not come of myself, but he who sent me is true, whom you do not know. Now, the first part of what Jesus says here is most likely sarcasm. Basically, what Jesus is saying, you think you know me, you think you know where I'm from, and you think I'm a fraud because I didn't just magically appear the way you expected me to. But, Jesus says, he who sent me is true, and your problem is that you don't know him. See, Jesus is going to expand on this in the very next chapter. I'll read the verses for you. We'll, we'll dig into it when we eventually get there. John uh, chapter 8, 37, that could be a couple of months from now. Who knows? But at any rate, in the very next chapter, Jesus is still talking to this group, and he says, they, they, they say, um, or Jesus says to them, I know that you're Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. That's key. I speak what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have seen with your father. And they answered and they said to him, Abraham is our father. And Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you'd do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. You do the deeds of your father. And then they said to him, we were not born of fornication. We have one father, and that's God. And Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God, <clears throat> nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Here's why, he says, because you are not able to listen to my word. You are of your father, the devil. Now again, we're going to unpack this more when we get to that section of scripture, but the point that Jesus is making here in chapter 7 is basically, look, I know the truth. And I speak with authority because I come from God and he sent me, right? But he says, your problem is that you don't know the Father. And because you don't know him, you don't know me. Now, this is consistent with what Jesus said in the previous chapter here in John, John chapter 6. He said, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up the last day. See, here's the deal. The Jews, they thought that they were chosen by God because of their physical, natural birth, because they were sons and descendants of Abraham, and as well because they kept the law of God. They totally missed the memo that God gave them the law to prove to them that they couldn't keep the law, that they were lawbreakers because they're sinners. God gave the law to, to reveal that we have sin within us. The law gave us the opportunity to sin. And it was always intended to be that big, huge billboard in your life and in my life to say, you need a Messiah, you need a Savior. Your conscience works that way, by the way. That, that, you know, as you go through life and you do things that are wrong, as much as the world wants to embrace and say, embrace this and do this and love this and don't have any shame, then why is it that you have that nagging voice within you that has shame and guilt? Because deep down, you know you're a lawbreaker. 
And there's only one person that can set you free from that guilt and shame. There's only one person who you can find forgiveness and cleansing from, and his name is Jesus. <clears throat> Jesus made it clear to these guys, God has to draw them before that they can come to God. Now that word draw is important. It's used of towing a ship or dragging a cart or pulling of a rope to set sails. But it's also used to speak of a gentle but powerful moral attraction, and that's what's in view here in John chapter 6, verse 44. <clears throat> the drawing, when Jesus says no one comes to the Father except for the Spirit, except for He's drawn, right? And, and it's a drawing by divine impulse. What is that? This is when God speaks through His Word. Jesus is the Word who became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld His glory uh, as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. This is what the Bible says. And so when God speaks through His Word to our hearts, this is where that drawing takes place. Maybe even today as we're talking, as you're hearing the Word of God. God may be drawing you to Himself. Maybe today, I don't know where you stand with the Lord Jesus. I don't know. If you were to die today, you know, you can answer the question, am I going to heaven? Am I going to hell? If you do not know the answer to that question, you can know for certain today. Because what I trust is that God's Word will not return void. It will accomplish the purpose for which He sent it. That It will water the dryness, the, the, the dry roots of your life. And rather than if you will hear and heed and take in the things of God and respond to God and invite Christ to be your Lord and Savior, what will happen then is your life will no longer produce the fruit that comes naturally to your flesh that brings guilt and brings shame, but it can, you can produce supernatural fruit. You can, you can overcome addictions and all of these things because God promises that He'll make you a new creation in Christ. If anyone's in Christ, He's a new creation. Old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. And I'll give you that invitation today. To receive Jesus Christ. Jesus speaking in John chapter 5. We were there weeks ago. The Father who sent me has testified about me. You've never heard His voice or seen Him face to face. And you do not have His message in your hearts because you do not believe in me, the one that He sent to you. You search the Scriptures because you think that they give you eternal life, but the Scriptures point to me. Yet you refuse to come to me to receive this life. Jesus speaking to those who were rejecting Jesus. It didn't fit their expectation of him. Listen, is God speaking to you today? Is he drawing you to hear and to heed the words of Jesus? Hebrews chapter 3 verses 12 through 15 says, Be very careful then, dear brothers and sisters. Make sure that your own hearts are not evil and unbelieving, turning you away from the living God. You must warn each other every day while it is still today so that none of you will be deceived by sin and hardened against God. For if we are faithful to the end, trusting God just as firmly as when we first believe, we will share in all that belongs to Christ. Remember what it says today when you hear His voice. Don't harden your hearts as they did in the rebellion. As the Israelites did in the, the rebellion. So this is the interaction that's going on. We've got an expectation. You don't meet the expectation. We're going to reject you. But yet, Jesus speaking the truth, and as we close, we see two potential responses to Jesus' message. <clears throat> Jesus says in verse 20, or 28, hey, you don't know me. You, or, you, know, you, you think you know where I come from. You, you, you think you know, you know all of these things. But listen, I know God. I know Him. For I am from Him and He sent me. And therefore, here's the two responses. They sought to take Him, but, but no one laid a hand on Him because His hour had not yet come. And many of the people, and it should say but many of the people, because this is a dividing of two groups. You've got the one hand, the people who, let's get him. They want to kill him. They want to arrest him. Let's get him. But many of the people believed in him. And they said, when the Christ comes, will he do more signs than these which this man has done? 
Like, like good grief. Like, what, what more can, can the Christ do than this guy is doing? He's got to be the Christ. See, two reactions to Jesus' message. The one is, there's those who reject his message. They want to take him, they want to kill him. And the other, they want to receive his message. They receive it. Here's a point of application as we close this morning. Which one are you? Which one are you? Now, I want to go over four application questions with you, and I pray you'd write these down and take a walk with them this week. First application question is this. Who do I say that Jesus is? Who do I say that Jesus is? Second application application question. These will be up after the service, by the way, if you don't get them all written down. Is the Jesus that I'm looking for the Jesus that I need? What Jesus are you looking for? Third question, what do my actions say that Jesus is? This is a, this is a great litmus test for you. If you say, hey, look, I value this, I value that, you know, it's the same thing. You, you take a look at your checkbook register, that'll tell you what you value, Right? And so what do your actions say that you, that, you, that you believe Jesus is or not? Here's a fourth question. How do my expectations lead me away from Jesus? That's the money question right there. I pray this week you take a walk with that question. How do my expectations lead me away from Jesus? Listen, let me, let me say this, kind of come full circle to where I started. All kidding aside, some of you were expecting a different election outcome this week. And some of you have shared with me that you're struggling, that you have a loss of hope, that you, uh, that, you know, oh, this is a train wreck, this is horrible, and, and all of these things. Let me, let me say this. Donald Trump, never was our hope. And Joe Biden will never be our hope. Jesus Christ is our only hope. We may have a citizenship, right? Amen. We may be citizens of the United States, but our citizenship, our true citizenship, is in heaven. It's in heaven. The source of our hope is Jesus. A couple of scriptures from 1 Peter. Peter says this, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His grace mercy, in His grace and mercy, or in His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. A living hope. Anything else besides Jesus is a dead hope. It's a dead hope and it's a dying hope. Jesus is a living hope. Peter goes on to say this, Set apart Christ as Lord in your hearts. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you the reason for the hope that you have. Listen guys, Jesus is still on the throne. Jesus is still large and in charge, and it doesn't matter what happens, you can trust in him. I just want to close with one illustration. It's not in my notes, but it just comes to my mind. You know, when Brenda and I were dating, I knew I wanted to marry this redhead, and, uh, and so uh, I sealed that deal quick, man. And, um, and so then we went shopping for, for a ring. And, um, and you know, the, the, this was, you know, both of us just going and, my, one of my sisters was dating a jeweler at the time, and so he called us over to his shop to, to look for diamonds. You ever been through that process where you're picking out the diamond? Man, it feels like a drug deal. Like, you know, the doors are locked, and, and, and what they do is they take out these diamonds, and inevitably, what do they do? They put them against a black backdrop, black velvet, right? Why? Because it catches all of the light, and you see all the facets of this beautiful gem, and it just shines brilliantly against a black background. Listen, Christianity grows best in darkness, right? Not that we have fellowship with the darkness, but that we shine as lights for Jesus Christ.
I don't care who's in the office of the presidency. I mean, obviously, I do care. But ultimately, I don't. Because Jesus is large and in charge. And some of you all need to hear that today. (laughs) Thank <laughs> you.